I'm very, very pleased to introduce Terry Eisen. Um, Professor Eisen's academic career has been most distinguished over the past six decades. From 1968 until 1980, he served as a professor of law at Queen's University. From 1973 to 1976, while on leave from Queen's University, he was chairman of the Workers' Compensation Board of British Columbia. From 1980 until 1985, he was a professor of law at Osgoode Hall Law School, where he is now Professor Emeritus. Eisen is the author of several key publications on workers' compensation in Canada, including 1983's Workers' Compensation in Canada and 1994's Compensation Systems for Injury and Disease, the Policy Options. He has published numerous scholarly articles and comments and reports on critical issues pertaining to workers' compensation law in Ontario and other jurisdictions. As recently as 2011, he participated as an expert consultant on the WSIB funding review. In 2012, Terry Eisen was the recipient of the Ontario Bar Association's Ron Ellis Award for Outstanding Contributions and Achievements in worker, Workers' Compensation Law. So I'm very pleased to present our last keynote speaker, Terry Eisen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I was planning on starting with experience rating, but most of my thoughts on experience rating have already been uh, mentioned by one of our colleagues who's already spoken. So what I'll do is I'll just add uh, a few points on experience rating that uh, haven't already been mentioned. The... Um, Demand for experience rating, uh, it, 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 uh, it, among other things, it, it failed to recognize that although premiums were paid by, uh, to a workers' compensation board by employers, most of those costs were borne by workers, and this is still hard, borne by workers, who pay those costs uh, indirectly by having their wages reduced. Uh, because it's normal routine for employers to... Uh, uh, pay a limited uh, amount to workers and some of it in wages, some of it in, in other things, but if the other things go up, the wages go down. So uh, Now, the, the total amount that an employer was willing to pay for a worker was the same regardless of whether uh, that amount, how, how that amount was applied. So it was usually workers who bore the whole cost of workers' compensation premiums. Now, that has become a little more complicated with the the creation of experience rating. Now, the political justification for experience rating uh, is the assumption that it promotes occupational health and safety. Now, that assumption was written in Section 83 of the Workers' Compensation Workers uh, Safety and Insurance Act. Work, sorry, Workplace Safety and Insurance Act in Ontario. Uh, but there's no evidence that experience rating has had that effect, even slightly. There is abundant evidence that experience rating uh, has been damage, has damaging effects on occupational health and safety. In particular, disabled workers do not return to work on a, in, in a, on a reliable medical opinion. When a worker has not fully recovered from the accident or disease, a reliable medical opinion on the safety of returning to work could usually be given only by a doctor who knows the worker's medical history, um, uh, has affirmed that the, uh, 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 sorry, has examined the worker, and also examined the, the, the work done by the worker at the place of employment. Now that rarely happens. So experience rating creates the risk of a disabled worker being coerced back to work, um, and uh, and then sustaining a further injury or causing uh, an injury to another worker. The use of new words in workers' compensation legislation or other uh, or is another cause uh, of confusion and damaging consequences. Uh, one of those words is uh, stakeholders. This word creates the false impression uh, that improvements can be made uh, in the workers' compensation system by accepting the demands of employers' representatives, now uh, or by negotiating with employers and workers' representatives, but uh, it's um, 
it, it can be hard to find anyone who really rep understands workers' compensation and who really represents employers. And of course, the important thing to understand here is that people known as employers' representatives are not people who represent the interests of employers. As well as cutting uh, uh, benefits, the, 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 the role played by employers' representatives in recent years um, uh, could explain a, a range of um, other legislative changes. For example, it might explain why the name of payments uh, made by uh, employers to a workers' compensation board has been changed from assessments to premiums. Now, that can create the impression that a board should now behave like an insurance company uh, rather than uh, as a government agency running a social insurance system. Now, reducing the amount uh, paid um, in, in benefits can then be seen as an achievement. Because experience rating causes the under-reporting to a workers' compensation board of occupational disabilities, it creates false statistics that tend to diminish um, occupational health and safety. Experience rating also seems to make safety regulations um, and um, enforcement uh, more flexible. This could explain why compensation is terminated in many cases uh, because the worker uh, felt it unsafe to return to work. Experience rating also creates an incentive for employers not to report to a, work, to a workers' compensation board disabilities sustained by a worker uh, that they have a, a, st a statutory duty to report. Now, in Ontario in particular, many employers have been prosecuted for failing to report to the WSIB a workers' accident. Uh, but those prosecutions do nothing to solve the adverse effects of experience rating. Now, related to this, the law of contract provides that a worker has the right to quit his or her job and seek employment with another employer. That's a, just a basic right. Uh, but that right is the, diff is the difference between employment and slavery. But experience rating creates a demand for the worker to return to work with and remain with the same employer whether he wants to or not. Now, experience rating undermines rehabilitation in other ways, too. Uh, for example, the number of rehabilitation officers uh, at the boards has been shrunk. In the 1970s, uh, the Ontario board had several rehabil rehabilitation specialists. Uh, an excellent one who I met uh, uh, was one who specialized in the rehabilitation of workers who had brain injuries. Now, that range and quality of rehabilitation has gone with the arrival of experience rating. An officer of the board has recently heard, has uh, recently been heard to say that the board is now trying to improve uh, vocational rehabilitation, but no significant improvement is apparent. And non-vocational uh, rehabilitation uh, seems to have been abandoned. Uh, except for a, a few small um, uh, measures. Now, experience rating can also result in a serious lack of uh, compensation for a worker with a partial uh, but, uh, sub uh, uh, but substantial uh, permanent uh, disability. That worker may be able to return to employment with the same employer over a few years but often uh, a substantial uh, permanent disability becomes an increasing impediment to work as the years go by. Now that problem was addressed uh, for decades when a disabled worker was paid a, 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 a partial pension for life, uh, regardless of what the worker was doing for work. Now that level of that pension uh, could be increased if the gravity of the disability increased. Uh, 
Now, those payments could help a disabled worker to relax uh, and thereby suffer less harm uh, from the permanent disability. Now, this is one of the many benefits that have been removed, at, uh, at least in practice, uh, since the arrival of experience rating. I, I might explain uh, of the damaging consequences of experience rating that uh, was received uh, from a, a well-informed lawyer in British Columbia, uh, and this was uh, this was very recently this year. She, she was a lawyer representing injured workers, and the example that uh, she gave me involved three cases in which the workers could, under the collective agreement, receive uh, for a year 100% of any wage loss. Now, the three workers uh, filed workers' compensation claims just in case their problems became more significant later on. But the employer hired a major lawyer, a major law firm, actually, uh, uh, that made demands for documents. Um, and, for example, they insisted on receiving that you authorize all health care providers to release to us all medical records, chart notes, cl clinical records, test results, uh, and any other clinical information which they may have in their possession with respect to this worker over the last seven years. Now, the lawyer explained that this was just one example of the, of the many costs and other problems that their clients, uh, the clients of her firm, uh, were having as a result of experience rating. In 2003, I was invited to speak at a conference uh, of the uh, uh, Canadian auto workers in Ontario. There was a discussion one evening in which the delegates were uh, uh, itemizing uh, their uh, complaints about the workers' compensation system. And uh, as I listened to those complaints, I um, made a record of, um, of, of what the what the some of what they were saying. And what I did is I put to myself this question, would anyone be making the complaint that this person is making if it wasn't for experience rating? And the answer was no, with regard to every complaint that any one of them was making about the current system. To avoid the damaging consequences of experience rating, including the negative changes to the legislation, and to have any hope of restoring the benefits that have been curtailed, the top priority should be the abolition of experience rating. And any attempt to improve experience rating would simply continue uh, the harmful consequences. I'll move on now to say a few words about the, um, the history of um, occupational health and safety and um, workers' compensation. One thing about uh, occupation in, uh, occupational health and safety is there never seems to have been a time when occupational health and safety was administered well in Ontario. Until, uh, unlike some other provinces, occupational health and safety was never enforced by inspectors on the staff of a workers' compensation board who could initiate uh, penalty assessments um, when hazardous conditions were found. In Ontario, the um, enforcement of safety regulations has always been the responsibility of a government department. So a penalty has only been obtainable by prosecution. And the Occupational Health and Safety Act, as amended in 2011, itemizes many things that should be done, uh, the rights of workers and, uh, and various procedures for um, interaction. But it leaves no way of imposing uh, penalties except by prosecution. In 2010, an employer was sentenced uh, to imprisonment for the first time in Ontario for causing the um, death of a worker. Now, that was, um, uh, that was fine, but of course it's not going to be significant in most cases. So it's not going to solve the problem. In practice, the, uh, 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 the um, 
the, in, the inspectors uh, in Ontario um, the um, uh, they seem to be very slow and at high cost. Also, in, in practice, they, they only seem to work after a worker has been disabled or killed, and that is on, on prosecuting. They only seem to prosecute after a worker has been disabled or killed. But uh, for occupational health and safety, it should be enforced without waiting for that to happen. And to achieve that requires an enforcement sanction um, that does not usually need a prosecution, though in an exceptional case there might be one. A few years after I arrived as chairman of the Workers' Compensation Board in BC, I learned about uh, workers who were losing their teeth from medical pollution. Uh, sorry, chemical pollution, from chemical pollution. They worked in a, de in the, in a department of uh, a large factory uh, in a small town. In fact, it was uh, one of the largest uh, corporations in Canada. The industrial hygiene department uh, at, of the board had been discussing the problem with uh, officials of the employer, but they were getting nowhere. We had a legal right to order the company to uh, close down the factory, but that would have been, that would have been uh, vigorously opposed by the company, by the union, by the workers, in including those who were lo losing their teeth. It would also... Uh, uh, have been opposed by many other people. So that was out of the question. Uh, so I had to think of another way of solving the problem. And first, we levied a penalty assessment. When that didn't solve the problem, we levied monthly penalty assessments. When that didn't solve the problem, we increased the monthly penalty assessment every month and at increasing rates. And then it was discovered that increasing the penalty assessments each month resulted in the attention of the problem within the company being moved up from the lower level of administration up to the top level of management. So eventually, the solution in the factory was, was, uh, was solved. The damaging uh, chemical was no longer used. The workers were no longer using, losing their teeth, and the penalty assessments uh, were ended. But that way of enforcing occupational health and safety is, it, it, it is only possible if a workers' compensation board um, is also responsible for occupational health and safety. For, for many years now, uh, British Columbia has been the only province left in Canada uh, in which occupational health and safety uh, is enforced by penalty assessments. It used to be in other provinces, but not now. But uh, in uh, New Brunswick, um, there has been some legislation recently showing that they may be um, uh, uh, recreating um, uh, the relevant uh, penalty assessments. Now, with regard to the history of workers' compensation, the the um, beginning of what's interesting now in Canada is what the courts were doing in London in the 17th century. And uh, it c could be seen as a major cause of, of current problems in workers' compensation in Canada and in the US. Most court decisions uh, in London in the 16th and 17th centuries were made in one of two procedures. One was the adversary system. Uh, uh, that's where the, the, the parties uh, present uh, conflicting arguments and the, and the court decides. And the, uh, and the second procedure was the inquisitorial system. And that's when the judge used initiative. Um, lawyers and, uh, and the parties might be allowed to some uh, initiating role, but the judge would be the leading initiator of evidence and arguments. Now, this method was used in the Court of uh, Star Chamber and in the Court of High Commission. Now, to extract confessions in the years, in the years before they were abolished in 1641, those courts used torture. Uh, so when those courts were abolished, uh, uh, no high courts in London were left using inquisitorial systems. Now, the other courts, uh, of course, uh, expanded and further developed uh, the adversary system. So when English lawyers uh, came to Canada in the 19th century, they came with 
a dedication to the average, to the adversary system. And that has uh, prevailed in the legal profession here ever since. And legal education in Canada nowadays usually makes no mention of the inquisitorial system. And it's uh, common nowadays for practicing lawyers never to have heard of it. Now, a crucial difference between the two systems is that the adversary system always places a burden of proof on the claimant. An inquisitorial system is usually designed to avoid that. Now, in 19, uh, well, uh, 1913, uh, Chief, when Chief Justice Meredith uh, created the workers' compensation system in Ontario, uh, he had had years of experience uh, with the adversary system. And in conducting his commission of inquiry, Meredith did not confine himself to hearings. He visited places of employment, he spoke to workers and employers, and he also spent some time overseas, particularly in Germany, And when he found that the modern European version of, uh, of the inquisitorial system. Now, the use of torture had long since gone, and Meredith found uh, how much more efficient the inquisitorial system was uh, than the adversary system. Uh, could possibly be for workers' compensation. So Meredith was determined that the adversary system should not apply to workers' compensation. He rejected all proposals for adjudication in the courts and even appeals to the courts. Meredith proposed a workers' compensation system in which administration and, and adjudication would be by a government board. Uh, but his report never used the word inquisitorial, probably because the reputation of, the, of an inquisitorial system was still um, uh, among lawyers uh, who knew of it. This could explain why the inquisitorial system that he recommended became known as the inquiry system. The Workers' Compensation Board, as it was then called, or Workmen's Compensation Board, as it was then called, would receive reports from employers, workers, and attending physicians. But if those reports did not provide all the information that was needed to decide a case, the board would use its own initiative uh, to obtain further evidence. Board doctors, I might say just a few words about uh, board doctors. Uh, the primary reason why decision-making at workers' compensation boards never worked well for decades was that the only professionals employed in the claims departments of a board were the board doctors. In Ontario and British Columbia and some other provinces, they had a legal department, but the lawyers in those departments were generally doing uh, other types of work. Um, they did not usually involve themselves in claims de uh, decisions. So adjudicators uh, would refer a case file uh, to a board doctor, not necessarily because it involved a medical issue, but because it involved some kind of difficulty, and the board doctor was the only professional person uh, on hand. Now, the result was that board doctors did not provide expert evidence, except uh, in simple cases, they became the decision makers. Now, they decided not only questions of medicine, uh, but also questions of non-medical fact um, and the questions of law. Now, one problem with this is that while legal education usually includes distinguishing questions of law from questions of medicine, medical education does not. Uh, I, incidentally, what, the only... The only um, medical education that I've ever known of anywhere in Canada where, where um, doctors coming were, were received an explanation of the difference between medicine and law it was in uh, Ontario back in the 1980s when I was an adjunct professor at the, uh, the um, medical school at the University of Toronto and I gave a lecture to the 
lectures to the uh, graduate uh, medical students there, explaining to them the difference between questions of medicine and questions of law. And this was novel to them. But there we are. They don't uh, normally get that nowadays. So it follows that any doctor's report based only on the lack of objective medical evidence is not a medical opinion at all. It's an erroneous opinion on questions of law. Well, I, I, I need, uh, I'll need to pass over some other things I was thinking of talking about, but I'll, I'll, I'll go on to the uh, final um, topic that I uh, wanted to talk about, and that is um, what's been happening in recent years as a result of uh, NAFTA and the WTO. Now, um, what happened was um, greater impediments to improving workers' compensation were the... Um, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that's NAFTA, uh, which began in January 1994, and then the uh, World Trade Organization, the WTO, which began in January 1995. And as many of us anticipated, NAFTA and the WTO created negative pressures on all of Canada's social insurance and social uh, security systems. NAFTA and the WTO appear to have uh, a negative influence on workers' compensation and rehabilitation. They also seem to stimulate experience rating. In effect, corporate America um, might now be seen as, for most purposes, the government of Canada and the provinces and territories. And... Uh, I suspected that the same might be true in the United States, and I found in an article that was published last month that, uh, um, that uh, two uh, of the American uh, uh, lawyers, uh, American academic lawyers, have written an article in which they refer also to lots of other American lawyers explaining how the same thing is, is happening in America, how in all the American states, except one that doesn't have it anyway, but whether, whether it, regardless of whether the workers' compensation system is run by the government or by insurance companies, uh, uh, still the benefits uh, have been declining uh, over the last um, 15 or 20 years. Um, now, uh, NAFTA and the WTO were supposed to create what they called fr free trade. Now, now, this would tend to reduce the profits of employers. It, it would reduce, uh, it would also reduce government tax uh, revenues by eliminating uh, most uh, customs duty. Now, it was predictable that this free trade uh, would lead to a reduction in workers' uh, compensation benefits and that it would uh, undermine the enforcement of occupational health and safety. And um, NAFTA um, yeah, and the um, WTO um, create uh, economic pressures uh, on employers that can promote hazardous conditions for workers and unhealthy working hours. Uh, we also know what, what, what happens to our taxes nowadays um, when we look and see uh, the the, uh, the amount of taxes that, that humans are required to pay has been increasing and the result of the increase in taxes is not to provide further benefits for humans, it's to provide further contributions to corporate America. The economic theory about the benefits of uh, competition uh, does not include any consideration of the effect, its effects on occupational health and safety. And with regard to occupational health and safety in particular, NAFTA and the WTO uh, seem to have increased the amount of time that government representatives, employers and union officials spend on uh, committee discussions rather than on the enforcement of occupational health and safety. Well, that, uh, that uh, concludes um, what I'm saying. Uh, I, I might just, just say as, a, as a, one final sentence, the only great reform I can see is if we could possibly find some way of restoring the whole workers' compensation systems to what they were 28 to 40 years ago. Thank you.